This video will be timestamped and a link to the script is in the description to aid your understanding. You heard about warriors, maybe a friend told you, maybe you saw some video on YouTube and now you're interested but don't know where to start or what warriors really even are. To be fair, this scene is quite complex and it's currently filled with veterans who have been here since the very beginning. At the moment of me creating this video, warriors are only really a German thing, which is a big part of why I created this video. As soon as the scene starts expanding, there could be a big influx of new players though, so fret not and join as soon as possible. Getting into it is easy enough and can be fun on many levels of dedication. But as a disclaimer, if you want to get deep into it and have a team that wins events, it is a very time, brain and patience intensive hobby, so you will have to know yourself whether that is something for you or not. That said, I am Halem and with this video I intend to inform you about the basics of what you could call a team eSport, that is warriors, from the bare minimum to going on a server, building cannons and fighting with people on your side. I will not be covering redstone basics, since that knowledge is sort of a prerequisite to building these kinds of contraptions, but you can also just start and learn the redstone part while you try to build warriors. In case you have poor understanding of redstone but still want to dive in, I provided some names and links in the description that may help you. Disclaimer, I might use some words during the video that only make sense if you keep watching it, so please don't give up if you don't understand something immediately. You don't need to watch the entire video in a single sitting by the way, that is part of why it's timestamped. I will hit you with an insane amount of information and don't expect anyone to soak it all up on the first try. Before we get into how everything else works, let's start by clearing up what a warrior is and what fighting with warriors means. There are some videos on this topic already, but for the sake of completeness I shall tackle everything here too. You have already seen some warriors in action during the intro montage. The exact definition of the features a warrior should have depends on not only the server but also the game mode. The overarching idea is always the same though. A warrior is a battle machine built in vanilla Minecraft filled with dispenserless TNT cannons, because using dispensers would make building cannons so easy it would be pointless, and also you wouldn't have to manually load the cannons which would make fighting a lot more boring. Warriors also feature shield technology to mess with the effectiveness of enemies' cannons, and they are usually designed in such a way that they look good while destroying you in sometimes a matter of seconds. And that is really all there is to it. Here's an example of a Steam War game mode ruleset and most things you need to know to build a compliant warrior that you are allowed to use. Server supporters will check every warrior before it is allowed to participate in battles, so make sure to very closely follow these instructions. If you intend to build for other modes or servers, you should always check the corresponding website first. Fighting with warriors is quite simple. There are always two parties, consisting of a variable number of fighters, one of which is the leader, who will choose the warrior they fight with. After both parties have chosen their warrior and set their status to ready, the fight will begin after a short countdown. Then everyone starts to load and shoot cannons. The win conditions depend on the game mode and server, with the only universal one being if one party has no more fighters. Others can be the inability to fire shots with cannons anymore, having no more water sources in your warrior, or destroying a high enough percentage of blocks that are part of the enemy's warrior. If you want to participate, the first thing you do is join any warrior server. At the time of me writing this script, there are two main servers, steamwar.de and myplayplanet.net, with their main differences being the rule sets that are in place. I personally play on Steamwar, but this is entirely up to you. Nothing prevents you from switching to a different server at any time anyways, so feel free to explore both, I'll link their websites. After joining a server, you usually have two main options which chat command you have to execute or GUI element you have to click to do something, depends on the server. To build, research and develop, you execute the correct command, which usually takes you to a private server, specifically for you, where you can build all your secret technology and manage who is allowed to join you. How exactly and what to build is something I'll cover later. The other option is to fight, which again, after using the right command, starts a server that places you in an arena, where you can wait for opponents and teammates to join, then load your saved warriors and fight each other. Teams are a very defining part of the scene. This has multiple reasons. Building and researching for days, weeks and months entirely on your own might be the perfect thing for you, but for most people it is not. Also the problems that need to be solved when building complex technology 
are often a lot easier to solve with multiple brains involved. The most obvious reason to join a team would be that in most events the maximum number of fighters on each side exceeds 1, usually ranging from 4 to 6 depending on the game mode. And fighting with as many people on your side as possible is a very high priority, as every person that can load cannons effectively increases your DPS output, leaving you at a major disadvantage if you are alone. The team system also introduces you to two general categories of technology, public and private, or team technology. Even when you have not built anything on a server yet, you can still fight with public warriors that are built by the community. Any cannon or shield that is built into one of these is considered public and anyone can look at them and learn from it. Obviously public tech is by no means the peak of what is achievable with hard work, so you start by understanding public tech and then continue by developing on your own and with your team, hopefully creating superior battle machines, which are then considered private, meaning no one else but you and your team will know exactly what you did to get there or how it works, unless they have built something similar or better themselves already. Sadly, the team system also creates a lot of toxicity. People boast about what their team has and what yours doesn't, and it is quite atypical that players of different teams would spend time together building, as they would likely accidentally share private or team information and or principles, which would decrease their technological advantage. Of course it doesn't have to be like that. There are some rare teams that work together, but I'm just telling you that this is how it usually is. So if you want to play together with a friend, it would likely be the easiest to either found your own team or join one together. The toxicity that comes along with the team dynamic and the competitive environment is why I'll remind you beforehand. Fun should be the absolute number one priority, and not just your fun, but everyone else's fun equally too. So practice good sportsmanship please, say good luck, have fun and GG, maybe even compliment your opponent for something that catches your eye. You can be part of a cleaner environment that is more fun for everyone with just the slightest bit of effort. Part of said sportsmanship is also that a single person in theory has the power to impact the entire scene by for example building an extremely good cannon and just making it public. Suddenly everyone would run around with that cannon and the entire competitive field would be shifted. That would of course suck a lot, and luckily it hasn't happened much yet. It would be very silly too, because absolutely most people would hate you for it. You would lose competitive advantage yourself, and you'd likely end up getting hard banned from all warrior servers. Teams also usually have different goals, opinions, and sometimes quite a lot of history. And if you want to join one, you should definitely inform yourself a little bit beforehand. Making sure you don't join a team that doesn't play a certain game mode that you like, or has bad reputation that you might be confronted with, etc. Another thing to consider is whether you want to join a team that is really competitive or more laid back. Mixes also exist. Competitive teams, as you could guess, are more stressful to be in, as you will likely be required to research and constantly improve your team technology, but it also means that you might have a higher chance at succeeding at events. These events are, as far as I can tell, the main focus of the entire scene. Some teams from other servers temporarily come over just to participate. An event is usually in some game mode and a tournament style series of fights with a certain topic or theme. For example, there are the leagues that are like the world championships and they kind of determine which team is currently the best in that game mode. But there are also less serious events and even public events where everyone participates with public level tech. Being in a team can get challenging emotionally at times, for plentiful reasons, with the hardest one for me being that often you spend time with people, build, fight, win and lose, and then they maybe decide that they want to join a different team for some reason. This happens often enough, leaving the rest of the previous team behind. Of course this doesn't block them from still talking and playing with the old teammates, but for the reasons described before it might look a little suspicious, and I just want you to be prepared for that. Just as a quick last tip concerning starting a team, have some way of organizing everything, it really helps. Most teams do this with Discord as it is quite easy to do. Since the inception of the scene, many types of cannons have emerged and are actively used, but their names are currently all German and quite random, so I'll try my very best to translate and unify them. But my attempt at this might not be the standard in the future when you watch this, because the scene constantly evolves. I also created a German-English translation sheet too, in case you are confronted with German terms. That's linked in the description. You can call your cannon whatever you want, and many teams just use actual human names for fun. No one can force you to call your cannon anything specific, but take this as an attempt of reducing the current amount of chaos. 
The goal here is to describe the canon as well as possible with the least words. The name usually has a fully written out long version that is only spoken, and an abbreviated short version that is used to save them as files or when used in text. You will notice that some of the abbreviations share their capitalized starting letters due to the limitations of language, but in those cases I added lowercase letters to be able to differentiate them. There are a few main things that determine the name of a cannon. The way it's operated by a player, where and how it can hit the enemy, what its damage looks like, with optional ones being how many steps it takes the cannon to arrive at the enemy, which frequency it shoots at, and its architecture. And then there are, of course, also some with unique names, but I'll do those last. For player operation, we have manual cannons, which add no special letters to the name. You load them up, ignite, and then run away so you don't take damage from the blast. Semi-automatics add the letters SA to the name. These are cannons where you continuously load TNT on the exact same spot, and the rest is done entirely by the cannon itself. The TNT gets moved out of the way, so you can just keep going, and when the cannon is full, it automatically ignites and shoots. These also usually have their launch point 8 blocks away from the player, so you don't take damage even if there is a shot being launched, which comes at the cost of size of course. Automatic cannons shoot a set amount of times, dispenserless of course, and add, depending on their fire rate, either FA, full auto, for the slower models, or RFFA, for the faster ones, which stands for rapid fire full auto. The border is 40 redstone ticks, by the way. These usually also add the clock speed of the cannon in redstone ticks to the name. For example, 40 tick or 6 tick. Also, the amount of shots they fire in total and the count of craters created. As a little example, you have an automatic cannon. It fires every 20th redstone tick, 8 times in total, and hits at 4 separate points, which makes it a 20T8S4P, insert type, RFFA. Type is a placeholder here. I will talk about the types of damage a cannon can create later, it would be added to the name there. If you inspect public automatic cannons, you will likely often see signs that say pull this lever at this time in the countdown to have the automatics hit as soon as the arena is unlocked, aka TNT damage is turned on. This does however require your interaction and precision, and thus eats your valuable time and is inconsistent. Luckily there are ways to make this process somewhat automatic. As soon as the battle countdown starts, a multitude of things happen. For example, players gain their battle kits, get thrown out of inventories, or on my play planet, where you build your automatic cannons with obsidian blocks instead of TNT in your schematics, that obsidian is replaced to TNT, things of that sort. If you find a way to consistently trigger a block update as soon as that countdown starts, you can quite easily hook that up to a timer that then triggers the automatic cannons consistently and precisely while you can already position yourself at a different cannon. Quick refill cannons or QRs are like semi-automatics in the sense that they allow you to keep loading, as they also have their launch point far enough away for you to not take damage. But unlike in SAs, the TNT does not constantly and automatically relocate itself, so you need to do the loading and priming manually, basically like a manual cannon with displaced launch point. Whichever of the previous methods of player operation is used, there are also some chamber architectural choices that influence the way you load up the cannon, which are count as player operation. These are not always put in the name, but definitely carry important information about the cannon's structure. Here we got overheads, OH, in case all the TNT that you load is above the player. These have proven to provide extreme comfort of use and especially speed, which is why they are quite popular amongst strong teams. Underfoot, UF, if all the to be loaded TNT is beneath the player. The amount of separate chambers that need to be loaded, for example, one chamber, two chamber, etc. Usually the amount of chambers is not mentioned if it is exactly as the cannon type implies. This sadly comes down to experience. And whether you can put TNT on every spot in the chamber, which makes loading much more comfortable, which is called full chamber or FC. In combination with the amount of chambers that could be one FC, for example. Next, where can your cannon hit the enemy relating to its own position? Cannons that shoot just straight with nothing special going on are just cannons and add no letters. Being able to hit higher than your own position adds AC for ascending, hitting lower hits DC for descending, doing both adds C, which stands for central. If your cannon can hit horizontally in a position other than its own, that adds SH for shift. Shifting terminology can get complicated because there are multiple shifting subclasses that can mix. 
These don't necessarily add letters to the name because usually just SH for shift is enough for you to know what the cannon does roughly, but it's good knowledge to have anyways. Using water to displace propellant or projectiles to achieve shifting is water shifting. Using slime to shift projectiles mid-air is slime shifting. Using blocks at certain positions to stop the TNT's velocity on an axis mid-air is called rebound shifting, and not doing that is called reboundless shifting. If the cannon can shift over the entirety of the enemy, it's called full shift. These descriptions can be combined, for example, to reboundless water full shift. Including the kind of damage your cannon does is mandatory and often implies the usage of certain principles or architectures. If the cannon just launches some TNT towards the enemy and leaves a regular spherical crater, it is just a cannon and no special letters are added. If the cannon creates a tunnel or channel of damage in the enemy, it is a stabbing or stab cannon, which adds S to the name. The cannon could also spray TNT all across the enemy, which would add SC for scattering. Scattering, but only on one axis, adds either H or V for horizontal or vertical, so HSC or VSC. Some cannons focus on scattering when the projectiles are already within the enemy, while the damaging process is happening. This is achieved by not compressing the projectiles much and having all of them explode one after another, so they kick each other around, which is usually used towards the end of fights to carve out the enemy after you used or lost your most potent stab cannons. A cannon doing exactly that is called a ripple cannon, because ripples on water are also an expanding chain reaction, adding R to the name. You can use a similar chain explosion technique, but compress the projectiles too, which will stop them from scattering around. Combine this with a long delay, making the projectiles explode very late relative to the point in time when they were launched, so the TNT can land inside pre-existing damage in the enemy and start carving downwards and you got yourself a mortar, adding the letter M. The last major type of damage to be inflicted on an enemy are warheads, abbreviated with W. Those create a sideways tunnel in the enemy by using projectiles that explode earlier to shift other projectiles to the side while already in the enemy. Since I don't know where else to put this info and here seems about appropriate, even though this is less a type of damage and more a technique, it has proven quite efficient for some cannons to do damage in multiple but concentrated spots, for example simultaneously stabbing at two points, with the major advantage of needing the same amount of pressure slash propellant to create two holes instead of one reducing the overall amount of TNT needed to create those holes. This method is called multi-impact. Multi-impact itself is not part of the name, but instead the count of impacts the cannon creates, by using the words bi, dry, quad, etc. So the mentioned example would be, first of all, a multi-stab, and more precisely a bi-stab. Another damaging technique is multi-coring. This is when multiple cannons were built and positioned in such a way that they are able to shoot into the same damage which is especially relevant in game modes that feature projectile limits, because this way you can achieve deep damage in short time despite the limit. In names, this is represented by appending single core, dual core, etc. for the amount of cannons that are part of the shared damage. The last technique is an addition for stabs. In case the opponent has shields on the face you want to hit, your damage would be totally screwed normally, and I'm going to show why later but you can build your cannon in such a way that it is able to pierce through the armor and still do its damage. If you do that, your cannon is considered piercing. Some cannons make use of mid-air directional changes. For example, a cannon that stabs into the side of the enemy, a side stab, usually shoots out of your own side, propelled by the so-called ejector propellant. Then later some more propellant explodes mid-air to change the direction forwards to the enemy. These are called boosters. And when at the side of the enemy, another heap of propellant, the injectors explode to change the direction again, now sideways, opposite to how it was launched originally. That process had three stages after which the damage was applied. For that reason, sidesteps are considered three stage cannons. But the typing of sidestep kind of implies this, because stabbing into the side is hard to do otherwise, so it is usually not included in the name. It is included if the amount of stages differs from the type norm. For that, another example. Front stabs usually have a single stage, getting propelled and then the damage immediately happens. In specific situations, however, players build two stage front steps, shooting the projectiles out of your warrior with very low pressure, and then having a larger amount of propellant explode directly in front of the enemy, 
accelerating the projectiles. You don't have to understand yet why they do that, but in this case the stages are included in the name because it is unusual and implies different architecture. The way this information is added by using the words first, second, third, etc. before the type of damage. So the names of the used examples would be side third step, where it is unnecessary to add because of the typing, and front second step or just second step, as a missing face specification implies frontal damage. Defining which face of the enemy you want to hit is also mandatory. After all, there are five sides, six if you play airship and theoretically warship, that you can apply damage from, which impacts the cannon's architecture immensely. As I mentioned before, if no face is given in the name, the cannon shoots into the front. From the sides onwards, it gets more complicated. If you hit those, and you do it in three stages, you just put a flank before the damage type. Stabbing cannons are always special. Traditionally, you just specify the stabbing direction by using sidestep, downstep, backstep, etc. But everything else uses the regular terms like flank. A different, for non-stabs, reasonable way to hit the side is by using two stages, leaving out one stage but still shooting out of your side, but towards the enemy slightly angled. Because of the reduced number of stages, the cannon then becomes a second flank type, 2FS. Of course you can also do it in a single stage, but then the architecture is very different, because you will need to extend the launch point out of your warrior for at least one block, and due to that this type of cannon is called a platform flank type. Any cannon that hits the roof is considered an artillery, abbreviated with A. If the artillery makes use of a mid-air directional change, by shooting in an arc high enough you would totally miss the enemy, but then when above the point you want to hit explodes some injectors that propel the projectiles downwards, it instead is an airstrike, AS. Being able to stab into the roof implies that you use an airstrike, as you would otherwise not have the appropriate angle and pressure to create a downwards channel within the enemy. So there is no need to call a downstab an airstrike downstab, just call them downstab, DS. When applying a sort of reverse airstrike method to the start of your arc, you get three stages in total. Shooting straight up with ejectors, then forward with boosters, and then downwards with injectors. This should sound familiar, since this is how sidesteps work, just rotated. Because the forward motion now starts way higher than with a regular artillery or airstrike, you add elevated, E, before those. And of course you can also have elevated downsteps, E, D, S. Remember, downstep only implies the airstrike, not the elevated start, so the elevation has to be mentioned. In theory, hitting the backside is possible by passing any of the four non-frontal faces and then reversing the direction of the projectiles. In practice though, only the top route is actively used, as you have gravity working for you, already dragging the projectiles down, which ultimately is desirable and it just turned out to be the most TNT efficient and comfortable to build, since that way all it really is, is an airstrike with slight adjustments. To indicate this type of cannon, I suggest just adding B for back before the damage type. If you feel fancy, you can also call them traitors because they hit you from behind, but back sounds the easiest. Keep in mind that back then implies two stages, so if you do anything else, you have to signal that appropriately. These can of course also be elevated. Two stages are realistically necessary to hit your enemy's bottom. Getting under them and then injecting the projectiles, since you work against gravity. There are two main methods to achieve that. Either you use a descending cannon that then changes the direction upwards, or you can drop both propellant and projectiles, then the boosters shoot everything forwards and under the enemy the injectors do their job. While the descending option is basically not used, drop cannons are fairly common, abbreviated with D. In the introduction of bottom-hitting cannons, I used the word realistically when mentioning the two needed stages. This is because you can, with drop cannons, theoretically also hit in a single stage. Everything is just dropped and then slammed against the enemy's bottom in an ascending type angle. Since this angle makes it so your damage won't ever really go very deep, this is not used much in practice and if you do you have to specify it by calling it a drop first type. Specifying the face is very important here as well, as a regular descending cannon would hit frontally, and a drop cannon can absolutely also do that with the correct angle too. If you add up to the name that mystery is solved, and then the use of injectors is implied. So for a regular drop cannon it would be a drop up type. And the last naming section is for special architectures and methods that for some reason got their own names independently from naming conventions. Here we have 
Smarties, which are basically airstrike slash back hybrids that use two barrels, which are separated by one block, with everything coming in pairs. Ejectors, injectors and projectiles, which makes them scatter a lot. That can be very useful for immediately covering much of the enemy's back or carving into the top in a wide area. So they are basically airstrike slash back scatter cannons. Multi-launch point cannons or MLPs, which first shoot projectiles and propellant around in your own war gear to get them to different launch points from which they then shoot, making shifting quite easy and reboundless. Though if one of the launch points gets shot, you can obviously not use it anymore. But since a launch point is a lot smaller than a whole cannon, it is more unlikely to be destroyed. Also, even though there are many places the cannon can shoot from, it is still considered a single cannon, which is nice for staying within the cannon count limitations dictated by the rule sets. Qs or Qs, which are just warhead cannons that can choose the direction the warhead damages in by using in-enemy injectors that can switch sides. Clouds, which boost both propellant and projectiles into the air with slime and are most useful as anti-player weapons in bow fights, as they scatter across a wide area on the roof. Crossbows, which are like a hybrid between quick refill and automatic cannons, as they, after being filled once, shoot multiple times. There are limitations to crossbow usage defined by the server rule sets, usually in a manner of a cannon may only shoot this many times with this much time in between shots, after being loaded only once. Coolers, most commonly sidestep coolers, are cannons that are built to kill a specific cannon type of the enemy as quickly as possible. They sometimes do the same thing as the type before the cooler part indicates, just with less TNT to make sure you get your shot out before the enemy. This is especially useful if you have scouts, people who watch the fight from the outside and tell you where enemies and their cannons are, so you can terminate some of their damage potential quickly. Hailstorms, which are airstrike ripple cannons, like Smarties, but only with a single barrel. IDS slash ISS, which are some of the most commonly used cannons. The abbreviations stand for instant downstep and instant sidestep. The word instant describes the fact that they immediately step through the entirety of the enemy. Putting the word instant in front of any other cannon type would not be very logical, as ripple or scatter cannons can't really penetrate an entire enemy due to their typing. And frontal steps basically imply that you will in fact step through the entire enemy, just because it is way easier to do than with down or side steps. Gusts are frontal three-stage cannons. They work a little bit like flanking cannons, just rotated. So they shoot out of your front, get propelled to the side mid-air, and then inject it into the enemy. The name gust is due to the way that it looks like a gust of wind pushes the projectiles to the side whilst shooting forwards. They are quite TNT inefficient compared to normal frontally damaging cannons, but have the advantage that their barrels are a lot smaller than regular shifting barrels. Towers are cannons that have their launch point very far below the point where you load. This separates the components a lot, which can make the cannon harder to kill if used with appropriate positioning. And anti tacks are very small and usually cover a large area with their damage. Their purpose is to prevent being tech KO'd, aka unable to shoot because you have no functioning cannons left, while trying to stay able to destroy the entire enemy. When gluing all of the abbreviations together for chat or file names, I suggest a roughly set order, and to separate the letters with dashes. The order is as follows. Where and how does it hit? What kind of damage does it create? How is it operated by a player? Let's run a few examples with this structure. The cannon hits frontally, can hit higher than directly in front of it, can also shift, hits in a single stage, does ripple damage and uses quick reload operation. It is therefore an ascending shift ripple quick reload cannon, or ASC SHRQR. The cannon hits the back, does so in three stages, utilizing ejectors that shoot your projectile straight up first, and scatters. It is therefore an elevated back scatter cannon, or EBSC. The cannon hits the roof, is automatic, shoots four times with 50 redstone ticks in between shots, and it stabs. It is therefore a 50T4S4P downstep full auto, or 50T4S4P DSFA. If you do anything other than what I mentioned here, feel free to make up your own terminology. Before we get to actually manipulating TNT, let's start with its properties and behavior, because this is certainly something that is more complex than you would probably initially assume, 
unless you're already knowledgeable in this area. I am not 300% certain on the very technical details. This is how I understand it. If you are very adept at the exact explosion physics, feel free to comment and correct me if I make mistakes. TNT is a full block that breaks instantly when left clicked and spawns a prime TNT entity when activated by a redstone signal. Upon being hit by an explosion, TNT blocks will also explode with slight random delay, causing a chain reaction. When primed, it falls through hitboxes it is already inside of, and does a little jump that we call prime motion, not just upwards, but also slightly into a random 360 degree direction, meaning it will not fall through a 1x1 hole below it when primed unless the space it wants to jump towards is blocked. Prime TNT is affected by water, swimming downstream like you would expect, and it is actually smaller than a full block in all directions. This property causes problems in cannons and it is really good for you that you know that now, sooner than later, because figuring out that this is the reason why something doesn't work takes luck, a big brain or simply another person to tell you. So if you were to have TNT stacked up vertically in a 1x1 tunnel and primed all of it, even when it is blocked in all four sideways directions, when it fell to the bottom it would actually not all be on the same position, but probably in as many positions as there were TNT that you primed, because of their size and the prime motion. As the TNT entities are propelled, the small positional differences between them will increase, which is something you often don't want. However, there are of course ways to, after the TNT fell down, bring them all into the same position, which is called compression. I talked about scattering cannons having uncompressed projectiles earlier, hopefully that makes more sense now. One way is to use water that is flowing diagonally and blocking the TNT at the end, so all of it is flushed into the exact same coordinates. Another one is to move the TNT on the remaining two axes. Remaining because as all of the TNT fell onto the same block, their height is already unified, so if you push the TNT around a corner it will be compressed to the same point. Be aware of the fact that pushing prime TNT with a piston head will leave the TNT positioned exactly in the middle of the next block, with half a pixel before and half a pixel after it. You can also launch it against a wall with slime, or push it with a full block to unify an axis, which for the slime method leaves the TNT exactly at the edge of the hitbox you launched it against, and with the block push method leaves it directly at the block you pushed with. This fact that you can position TNT precisely on different positions within the same block is called subpixel displacement. Other than that, prime TNT acts like any entity, being affected by physics and gravity, activating strings and pressure plates and so on. The explosion caused by TNT will damage players who are less than 8 blocks away, as I already mentioned when talking about SAs and QRs. Also very important to know is the order of directions moving prime TNT is calculated in within a single game frame, as this knowledge is crucial for building rebound shifting cannons. The order is as follows. It is first calculated how high or low the TNT will be in the next frame, then where it would be on the axis it has the highest velocity on, and then only one axis remains. This means that if you shoot TNT diagonally upwards, you can't create a diagonal tunnel for it to fly through, if you did that it would actually get blocked. Instead you need to create something weird like this, where for every frame there are three connected tunnels, one for each axis. In some specific situations, for example when building drop cannons or compressions, you also have to actively think about the speed TNT falls down at when simply primed. It has a terminal velocity and an acceleration per frame. The little jump TNT does on priming also has to be considered here, and whether or not that jump is blocked at the top or not. Another note on that jump, depending on the method you use to prime the TNT, this jump can actually kill your cannon. If a position next to the TNT you are priming has no hitbox, the TNT can jump there. In a setup like this, it will randomly blow you up. This can be fixed by allowing the TNT to jump upwards by placing a block above it that does not have a full 16 pixel hitbox to the bottom, and then blocking the space next to that top block. That way it can jump, calculate against that side block, then fall straight down. One thing you should only do with caution is pushing TNT mid-air for the reason that if you do that with a piston powered by a pulse shorter than two redstone ticks, it won't cancel the sideways velocity of the TNT. If the TNT still has to fall after that and there are no blocks below the position it was pushed from, it will not calculate against anything 
and keep falling to the side, ending up in a spot where you probably don't want it, because its position is now randomized on one axis. These weird quirks of pistons in combination with TNT are partially why new players are often told that they shall experiment with just pistons for a few weeks before diving any deeper. Another thing to be aware of is that if TNT lands on the ground with a sideways velocity higher than zero, it can touch the ground and still move to the side, if unblocked. The distance it moves that way is often intensely minuscule and thus problems that arise by mechanics that move TNT in a way that is barely or not perceivable, even tinier than subpixel displacement, are called micromotion problems. Knowing how Minecraft calculates explosions can also help you with understanding how and why things work the way they do. Explosions affect blocks and entities differently. For block destruction calculations, 1352 rays of slightly random strength are cast onto a three-dimensional grid outwards from the center of the explosion. If the ray passes through any block other than air, its intensity is reduced by an amount depending on the block's resistance. And if the ray's strength isn't reduced to zero by this, the block will break. This is entirely independent of hitboxes and is instead judged by block space, which is also why water blocks explosion damage. The water occupies the block space that the explosion occurs in, and since water has a blast resistance of 100, it immediately weakens all rays to a strength of zero. This enables some interesting strategies. Sometimes you see slabs stacked on the upper parts of warriors as armor, even though endstone slabs have the same blast resistance as just endstone blocks. Naturally, it seems weird to do then, but if you test it and let TNT explode on a layer of endstone slabs, you'll notice that only a single one will break every time. When TNT explodes, the explosion will be within the block space of the slab, so at the ray's starts, they will hit the slab, have their strength reduced by the slab's blast resistance, but it won't be zero, which will cause the slab to be destroyed. After that though, the rays are too weak to destroy any more slabs. For entities, their bounding box is divided into a grid, and rays are cast from the center of the explosion to all points on that grid. The percentage of rays that reach their destination unobstructed by the hitboxes of solid blocks is called the exposure. The entity's velocity resulting from the explosion is then calculated by mashing together the exposure, the power of the explosion, the distance between the entity and the explosion, and the direction is calculated by the angle of the explosion centered to the feet of the entity. Only in the case of TNT though, or other entities it's the eye height of the entity, but they are not relevant to us. Explosions are created just very slightly above the feet of TNT, which is also why an explosion is in the block space of slabs when the TNT lies on them. If you ever try to create a straight angle by putting both propellant and projectiles on the same height, this is why it won't work. The explosion is created slightly above the propellant's feet, and the direction is calculated from the propellant's explosion center to the projectile feet, so the resulting angle is downwards, which is likely where ground is. The last point I'll count as a property, Ghost TNT is a multiplayer based phenomenon. If you prime TNT at the same time of pushing it, it will, on the client side, be both pushed and primed. The TNT block that is pushed, however, is just an illusion and will disappear once touched, or rather updated. It can create some weird problems and confusion though, so be aware of that. If you want to build your first cannon, you're probably very overwhelmed with what kind of cannon you should even build, or what makes a cannon good or bad. For this reason, I will give you my subjective opinion on what to prioritize in cannons sorted by importance. First, reliability. A cannon shouldn't have a failure rate above a certain threshold that you kind of need to decide for yourself, but I suggest it be quite low. You're really hurting your own combat power if your cannon doesn't always shoot where you want it to shoot, doesn't always do the exact amount of damage it's supposed to, or even has a chance to kill itself, making it unusable. Therefore, this should be your absolute highest priority. Second, flexibility. It's great if your cannon is reliable and can totally stab through the entire enemy in a single shot every time, but what happens after that? Now this cannon has done its job and you go to the next one, but shocker, your enemy killed that next cannon already and it'll take some time walking to get to yet another one. Time that you could have been busy firing at the enemy had your first cannon more than a single mode, aka more than one point it can hit. I cannot recall the amount of battles I've seen where only few cannons were remaining for either team, and they'd still have had a chance if those were more flexible. Third, speed. 
This one likes to stir up some controversy every now and then because some people feel the need to cheat, use auto clickers and get banned. With speed I mean the time it takes A or multiple users to load the cannon and fire it, until the damage is created. It's not only about the user's CPS, clicks per second and skill though, but also about how easy it is to fully load the cannon and how much TNT you need to load in total. This is also why when going deeper into good technology, teams try to reduce the TNT needed to an absolute bare minimum that can still reliably kill, and to have as few and easily loadable chambers as possible. Fourth, size. You have the ultimate cannon, it does everything, and that reliably and quickly, but it's now so big that it's really easy to hit and it dies constantly because of that. This one is the hardest to master, building compact, and some veteran teams really take this to the next level, often at the cost of comfort of use. You should definitely practice this on the side, but the first three points are what will really win you fights in the beginning. This size point does get relevant at very high levels of competitiveness though, and that is why bigger teams often compare their cannons by block volume, since they assume that they otherwise both fulfill most of the other points well enough anyways. When starting out all you need to build your first, likely unsuccessful wargear are some frontal stab cannons and maybe something that can hit the roof. Because I not only want to guide you through the general cannon building process but also through how stabbing works, we are going to build the simplest form of a stab together. Since you know in theory how all of the other fancy stuff like shifting or ascending works as I have shown footage of it in the types of cannon section, you should be able to go from there and do your thing. A general rule of thumb is that a stabbing cannon, if built correctly, should always stab as many blocks deep as it has projectiles. I will build on Steamor, so let's take a look at the information given in the rule set first. At the time of making this video, it says here that a warrior is 47 blocks deep, so to reliably kill cannons when stabbing frontally, we should stab for at least 42, so there are only 5 blocks left, which makes it unlikely for anything to still be alive in the back. There are no good reasons to step entirely through the enemy, you would just be wasting TNT and time. It also says that a warrior may extend 12 blocks frontally. This needs to be taken into account. If you want the cannon to be piercing, you will need to add those 12 blocks as projectiles, so you can still manage to only have 5 blocks left. But since lower level warriors rarely have very heavy shields, I will just build a normal one for now, so 42 projectiles, no modes, just to suggest my version of a clean build process. Keep in mind here that some game modes like Steam Wars Mini Warrior have projectile limits. For example a maximum of 8 per shot. In which case you don't really think about how many you should use, always take the maximum and then try to do as much as possible with that. First you need to build the launch point, which is the core of the cannon and most of the functionality and flexibility is decided there. The rest of the cannon will just be chambers to load TNT into and prime the TNT in the correct order, then compress slash push it so it rests exactly where you want it to within the launch point. I am currently on my build server on Steamor that I joined by typing slash b into the chat. I then flew over to the warrior plots. Over there is the so called test block which is used as a target to shoot at, and that is the build frame. If we want to start building our cannon we kind of already need a strategy, since that determines the placement of the launch point. One thing to consider for example is that if you have multiple cannons aligned on even a single axis, you are running risk of all of them getting killed by a single enemy shot. Remember, if the enemy really wants to, they can in theory stab through your entire machine in a single shot at any position on any face. Since a cannon is timed very tightly as you will see later, it does optimal damage at only a few different distances to the enemy, especially the ones with higher pressure, so this distance is one of the first things you have to decide. Since I assume that you are playing against newer players like yourself, they probably don't have side steps, down steps or back hitting cannons, especially not instant ones. So the spot in your very far back should be the most secure. You also have to think about how much space the chambers are gonna take up and which way you will rotate them. You can place them sideways like this or in a classical way like this. Because we don't want fancy stuff for now, I'm going with the classic route, so I'll need a higher distance from the back. You can optimize this in any way you want. Now that we've figured out the position of the launch point, let's build it. But first a general tip for building. Use the load and save toolbar functions. The keys to use them are found in the control options under creative mode. And after you set them up, they allow you to very quickly access the most common blocks you use for building. I extremely rarely actually go into the creative inventory and manually search for something, 
which speeds up building considerably. Another tip that has helped me very much throughout the years is using appropriate graphics. What I mean by that is using a resource pack that is clean and easy to look at and helps your eyes when looking at complex contraptions, and also adding redstone specific resource pack add-ons. The setup I've been running for a long while now and that I can recommend in case you don't want to research the topic or don't already have something better is Faithful together with the Faithful Redstone add-ons. And I also threw a texture in there to increase the visibility of strings since it's used frequently enough in Wargears and is hard to see. Redstone add-ons are the biggest gain here as they usually do things like turn redstone into a clean simple line instead of that horrible default graphic. Anyways, this is what the finished launch point looks like, one of the most classic ones that exist. The endstone block is where the propellant will rest, which always has to be covered in water to prevent the explosion from dealing damage to your war gear, and the wall is where the projectiles will rest. The hitbox of walls is actually 24 pixels high, not 16 like a regular block, which means a wall is 1.5 blocks high, so players cannot jump over them. But what's interesting is that they don't actually have a graphical body that represents this, and raycasts actually don't hit this extended hitbox either, so the exposure is not reduced by it. The pixel difference between these hitboxes is what we call the pixel angle. In this example the difference between 16 and 24 is 8, so this is an 8 pixel angle. Usually if you are not satisfied with the angle, you will try to increase or decrease this pixel difference by trying different combinations of blocks, which is why I always have one of these pixel charts around. I put some sources into the description that make creating these quite easy. Keep in mind though that different block combinations will not only change the pixel difference, but often also affect exposure differently. Since that also influences the result, you might often run into situations where pixel angle changes won't immediately achieve what you expect, which you can of course use to your advantage if you are experienced. For example, 5 pixel angles are not all the same, so if one doesn't work perfectly, that doesn't mean other 5 pixel angles won't either. If you are wondering why I use Endstone as the default building block, that is because Endstone is the block with the highest blast resistance that can still be destroyed by explosions. This way, fights last longer than if you were to use lower resistance blocks. Some game modes intentionally use lower resistance maxima like 6, like iron blocks, so read the rule sets. Since I'm already talking about block choices, when constructing you are sadly often forced to use or not use certain blocks, since they all have different properties that you have to work around. For example, is the block conductive, aka does it pass redstone signals, like endstone, unlike glass? Is it sticky, aka can it be moved by slime, like endstone, unlike glazed terracotta? Is it movable, aka can it be pushed by pistons, like endstone, unlike jukeboxes? Does it break when moved, like melon, unlike endstone? And how does it react to water? Is it loggable like trapdoors? Does it get flushed like carpet? And so on. Many combinations of these properties exist as blocks, some don't. So creating angles can get very research heavy. Especially when introducing more modes into your cannons with the launch points becoming more modular. Be aware of the fact that a 5 pixel difference can't only be created with a flat block and one that has a height of 5 pixels but any other combination too, 1 to 6, 2 to 7, etc. This might sound obvious, but I've struggled before myself creating the correct angle and then remembered this very fact and felt real dumb. In case you're wondering what the pressure plate is for, it doesn't reduce exposure since it is a non-solid and it isn't flushed by water, so I'm using it to make sure my projectiles aren't flushed away right now, even though you could use water to compress them. Since in simulators, which is the next tool we'll use, the TNT is always perfectly unified unless you willingly turn that off anyways. There are also other ways to manipulate water by the way, and knowing them can be very helpful. I could for example also have the water start one block further to the back, and then put a waterlogged block in the floor where it's supposed to stop, and that will drain the flow. Before we start the simulation, we have to settle on an amount of propellant we want to use. This will mainly determine how fast the projectiles fly towards the enemy, and finding the perfect amount takes practice and experience. I know that about 24 TNT would be a more efficient amount to use, but because having a lower amount results in needing more prime phases and going too low makes you unable to stab, and I know that this chamber architecture coincidentally gives you both 32 propellant and 42 projectiles very nicely, we will just go with 32. Now we can simulate to find out in which order and how much TNT at a time we have to prime to deal those 42 blocks of damage. In other words, we'll try to figure out the prime phases. On my play planet, the simulator works with shulkers and a clock to prime, 
On Steam War you have to type slash simulator, after which you get an item that looks like a blaze rod, but is far more potent. Now I can, by right clicking, place points where I want to spawn TNT. We'll do the propellant first, since that's already been determined. So I'll chunk 32 TNT here, that prime immediately. Then I'll place a single projectile that will prime a lot later, so I can trace the flight path and then reduce the delay until it is perfect. The ticks are in game tick here, not in redstone tick. This is an important difference, in case you didn't know, one redstone tick is two game ticks long. So for a repeater on the first setting to activate, it doesn't take one frame, or game tick, but two. I'll abbreviate redstone ticks and game ticks with RT and GT from now on. If you ask yourself why I didn't put the projectile directly above the wall, I want to remind you of what I said in the TNT properties section. When primed, TNT will fall through hitboxes it is already inside of. Since the hitbox of walls extends above its graphics, the TNT would simply fall through the wall when primed. That extended hitbox can be very useful though. It elevates the TNT by half a block, even though there is no block there, so now you can push it from more positions. If I fire the simulator now by left clicking, you will see that the TNT simply flies off into the distance. This is because I didn't cancel its upwards velocity and have a high angle. But we can cancel that velocity by implementing a simple rebound. Since we know that TNT always calculates its height first during a frame, we can cancel its Y velocity by putting a block directly above the launch point, but at the very maximum as high as it would calculate in its first frame of calculation. If you put the block higher than that, it will simply shoot normally and not rebound. Now let's turn on auto trace and also immediately view the resulting traces by typing slash trace auto and slash trace show, then fire the simulator again. Now it shoots straight forward, and I can see that the projectiles calculate thrice before hitting the test block. Because of this, I know that the first chunk of projectiles should be primed 3GT after the propellant. I'll put a large amount of projectiles on 3GT now and see how deep we can get within a single phase. You can sort of get an idea of how far that will be, judging by the space in between calculation points and also by how close the last calculation already is in front of the enemy. Naturally, all TNT that explodes in a single frame could only ever stab as deep as to where the TNT would be in the next frame. As you can see, a chat message popped up with the amount of damage that we did on all three axes, and the axis where the most damage was dealt is also highlighted. Anyways, we ended up stabbing for 11 blocks, even though we threw much more TNT at the target. I can now reduce the amount to 11 projectiles and check if we still end up stabbing for 11. Which we do. Looking at the trace of the resulting channel, you will notice that all of the explosions are perfectly one block apart. You might think that this is illogical, after all, all of the TNT has to explode at the same time, in the same spot. At least you primed it at the exact same moment and shot it from the same position, with the same pressure. What you have to understand here is that because of the way computers work, they can't really do anything exactly simultaneously. Even though it is not perceivable, in Minecraft TNT primed at the same time actually isn't. We don't have to get too deep into that since it's a very complicated topic, but know that what's happening is that one after another the TNT will calculate forward and explode. Which is why the next TNT always gets one block deeper, because the endstone that was once there has been blown up. The most common use of manipulating the so-called update order is by priming some TNT with the signal coming from a comparator, and some by a 1RT repeater. Since the repeater is calculated first and the comparator after that, even though the TNT is primed during the same game frame, it will still explode in that order, creating what we call a zero tick phase. Side note, if the damage slash trace of your cannon is bad and looks weird like this, the projectile's velocity was cancelled mid-step, which happens when they're blocked while calculating their position. And that means that there was not enough TNT on the previous prime phase to free the spot where it would move to next. Anyways, we figured out the amount of TNT for the first prime phase, so now I'll add another big chunk of TNT to the next one, to figure out how much is needed there. And we'll continue to do this until all of the 42 projectiles are used up. This time we got an additional 21 blocks of damage. It might sound unintuitive that we got deeper on our second prime phase than our first, since the forward velocity of entities naturally decreases over time. I already kind of teased this earlier when we determined the delay for the first prime phase and it's easier to visualize by shooting through nothing once. The first calculation point is very shallow and it needs to be freed, but doing so takes very little TNT. Getting from there to the next calculation point, however, is a far longer way. 
Now I'll again shave off the unnecessary TNT and shoot to see if it does the same damage. It does. There is no need to ever put more TNT on a face than you have projectiles, so instead of using a big chunk again for the next one, I'll just use the 10 leftover TNT and shoot once again. And that's it, the simulation is done. It won't always be this easy, especially not if you use as few propellant as possible. You'll have to try around and gain some experience over time. One mechanic we didn't run into because we worked with high pressure is that exploding projectiles will affect each other like they would affect any other entity like players when their calculation points are within an 8 block radius to each other. The traces this causes look like this. To understand why, you'll need to remember why it was that stabbing works. During the same frame, all projectiles fly forward and explode one by one. If the next point of calculation is within explosion range to the current one, the projectiles that fly forward and explode first will continuously affect the ones that follow after them, reducing their forward velocity, which is why they calculate less and less far forward. This can make figuring out low pressure prime phases really hard, and can even, if the distance between calculation points is short enough and a lot of projectiles are used, reverse the direction your projectiles fly in. Now let's build the skeleton of the cannon. Not everyone does it like this, but I advise to do it, since it makes the building process that much cleaner. What I mean by skeleton is that we first put all mechanical components in place that we know we'll need. Of course I know this is experience based, but you'll get better at it over time. That way we know everything that has to be wired up and can actively choose better and cleaner routes. In other words, make the cannon less scuffed. I've seen many people who, while building, randomly start chucking endstone at the cannon and already armoring it, then later griefing it back open when trying to wire something. Don't do that, because not doing it will help you realize just how much real estate you really have for wiring. I'll also wait with adding the water as long as possible, since mishaps can happen and redstone doesn't like water. If you really want to be on the safe side, just copy your cannon every once in a while when building. How to do that later in the video. Which other important technical parts does the cannon need? This one mainly compression. After the projectiles are primed and fall down, they will randomly lie somewhere in this area. But we want them there. There are a million ways to do that, but I'll just put pistons here, here and here. If you power them in the correct order, the TNT should end up where we want it. I know from experience that because our propellant chamber is quite high and water compression is pretty slow, we'll also end up needing some propellant compression, so we'll also put one piston here and one here. That should be all main technical components. We should also wall off the chambers and add a roof now to prevent TNT from jumping outside when we test if everything is working, insert a middle bridge to prevent projectiles from jumping into the propellant chamber and vice versa, and also add something like a ladder or door to the entrance so no propellant can fall out. Be aware that this kind of ladder slash door block is not the perfect solution, as due to the order of motion calculation and the prime jump, TNT can in extremely rare cases still jump outside. It's rare enough that I'll do it like this for now. You should keep in mind that the blocks used for walling off and the roof do not necessarily have to be endstone, but are actually potential wiring spots if the wiring used has the needed hitboxes. It's just that you kind of need these blocks for testing the cannon. First I'll wire the propellant. All of it has to explode during the same frame or you'll lose an immense amount of pressure. A pattern like this will be an easy way to activate all of the observers. Don't worry about these buttons, below 1.18 they are needed to redirect the redstone at the top, otherwise the hopper wouldn't power. In 1.18 plus they are unnecessary. This is a good time to already hook up the propellant to a way to fire the cannon. I like using a note block with observers, that way you can just right click a full block, which is easier than hitting a button, and other than a button, the signal from the note block observer combo only triggers the observers once instead of twice. Next we'll wire up the projectiles. We needed 11 on 3 GT, 21 on 4 and 10 on 5. For the first prime phase we need an uneven GT delay that we can't create by just using regular redstone components. A repeater on the first setting would be 2 GT and one on the second setting would be 4. We can however make use of game mechanics in definitely intended ways and introduce scaffolding to our circuitry. Scaffolding detects whether it has ground beneath it and changes its appearance accordingly with a delay of a single GT. Trapdoors can be a flat surface but can also be powered to not provide ground anymore with no delay. If the scaffolding has no floor beneath it, it would normally break unless you connect it to another scaffolding that does. 
This is what a finished 3GT delay line looks like. Zero for removing the scaffolding's floor by powering the trapdoor, one for the scaffolding to act accordingly, and two for the observer to detect the block update from the scaffolding and send its pulse. And this is how it looks implemented into the cannon. Now we need to update exactly 11 observers for the first phase, which can be done like this. Because I know that the 4GT phase uses 21 TNT, one half of the projectile chamber is exactly 21 TNT, and the first and last phases are both uneven and 21 TNT together as well, I will put all of the 4GT phase TNT on the other side of the chamber like this, and now I can simply put all of the remaining 10 on the uneven delay side, and use a single observer to create the 2GT difference from 3 to 5. Now that that's done, we can wire the compression, and you need to be aware of the time it will take for the TNT to fall down. So in a setup like this, there will have to be some delay in between stuff being primed and the compression hitting. I'll draw from the propellant signal, give it some delay, and attach a piston-observer combo at the end. If I just took an observer signal from a 4RT repeater, it would fire twice. Once from the repeater turning on, and once from it turning off. That would make the compression fire twice instead of just once, which isn't necessarily harmful, but it can be, and it annoys me anyways. From there we just go with an observer line and then power that block above the piston right there. Because of how pistons work, the other one will also fire since it has power from diagonally above and is updated by the first one. Then I'll put a lamp there that reacts to the redstone input from the other side and connect an observer to it. Circle around and then go into the bottom pistons with a second setting repeater because the lamp would also generate two signals, one from turning on and one from turning off but this way it will be a single, longer signal. I'll power those two sideways pistons by using another piston observer combo, which will first fire the propellant compression piston when extending, and then the projectile comp piston when retracting. By the way, be careful with this piston observer combo. If you use a short signal like that of an observer to power the piston and the observer that's pushed by the piston faces said piston, the observer will actually give out a pulse on retraction too, because it sees the piston head touching it. Only one left. I will put in the water now, because I'm quite certain most of the important stuff is done, and the water is part of the propellant compression we're trying to build right now. Because of the way the TNT will flow diagonally in the water, it will, after a short amount of time, have swam just enough to the right to be pushed by this piston, also taking into account the time it took for it to fall down and come into contact with the water. We still want it to be pushed as early as possible so it always safely reaches its destination. Because of these factors the timing is quite tight. You'll just have to try and error this, but of course you might be able to estimate this eventually. I've just tested it a bit and just building an observer line like this seems to do the job fine. You might notice a huge flaw with this cannon right now. It doesn't have a hole to shoot out of. We could punch a hole in the front just below the ceiling, we would have to change the ceiling block before the hole to one that doesn't have a 16 pixel bottom hitbox though, and add a block over the exit so the TNT can calculate upwards, get its velocity cancelled, and doesn't jump into the barrel. That makes loading from the bottom harder though, since that will exceed the player's upwards block placement range and they'll have to jump, so I propose a different version for now. Instead we just replace the ceiling on that side with scaffolding. That way it's easy to load, and since TNT can fly through scaffolding, this is perfect. Let's fully load the cannon and see if it actually does the damage we expect, and also turn on traces to check what happened in case it doesn't. When loading, you have to be careful to only load the spots you're actually supposed to. There are parts of the projectile chamber that should not be loaded, above the walls, if you don't want to blow up, and there are two blocks under the bridge that shouldn't be loaded either. After firing, we see a problem you should be familiar with, and we can fix it by putting a block above the barrel at the exit point. Now we fire again and see that the trace looks terrible, and you'd notice that the damage is inconsistent too if we fired it more often. This is because while we compressed the TNT onto the same block, we didn't compress it to the exact same position within the block. While the left half of the projectile chamber actually is mostly compressed except for one row, the right half is not. Every single block of TNT does the prime jump, but only the left half gets pushed to the side. Additionally, the first projectile row is not guaranteed to be pushed on the Z-axis. In private cannons you'd normally make sure this is not the case, 
But since you know in theory what you have to do, I'll leave the rest to you. In my case I know that the TNT will only fly forward, maybe slightly to the left, because the propellant is perfectly unified at the rightmost position, because it's compressed by a diagonally flowing water. So all I have to do is put a block to the left of the barrel hole at the first calculation point, so the projectiles can slam against it sideways. The projectiles still fly through the 1x1 exit, since they calculate sideways last, upwards and forwards first. Now that that's done, the cannon does the damage it's supposed to. You might wonder why I even compress the projectiles if the damage is fine anyways. If that rebound point in the front is hit, the cannon will either be inconsistent or fail. Also, if you want to add shifting to the cannon, your barrels and rebound points will be huge and somewhat RNG based. So just compress your stuff. Let's also add one rebound ascent mode to the cannon for demonstrational purposes. We know that we want to be able to hit higher at will. So first off we'll need to make that top of the barrel height cancel block optional. To do that we can just introduce a sticky piston and wire it up with observers from inside the cannon so you can reach it easily. By convention the most common simple ascent mode triggers are fence gates. Now if the fence gate is open the upwards velocity won't be cancelled and if it's closed it will be. Now we need to trace once again and find the rebound point for the height mode. I'll get a deeper insight into the calculation points by using slash trace show dash a. Now I see that I'll need an additional sideways rebound here and I'll put one rebound up here to cancel the height. If I shoot again the cannon will deal the same damage but further up. This barrel setup is questionable because now you have two separate barrels for only two modes. There are ways to deal with this in more intelligent ways but you'll figure it out. And your TNT should be compressed to do that. There are some finishing touches I'd recommend every cannon to have. Those are TNT chests and spots you can easily reach so you don't run out of ammo mid-fight, a lectern with a book that describes how and what the cannon does so anyone who has it can use it well, be aware that lecterns emit redstone signals with a strength depending on the page you are on, yes you can build high comfort mode switches with this, signs at important spots that point at mode switches or similar elements, and maybe your player head, because you built the cannon and are very proud of it. At the very end you can armor the cannon if you want to. Put slaps on all the connections so they don't get cut, and at spots where lines would otherwise power components they shouldn't. Cover spots that pistons need to push through with something like cobweb that breaks on push, just so you don't accidentally put blocks there and break the cannon and the rest can just become regular endstone. Now you can select the cannon with world edit and check how big it is if you want. This one has a volume of 480. Before putting it into a war gear, I'd stress test it. Shoot it many times, switch modes, see how consistent it is, to make sure there are no bugs. This can sometimes take longer than everything up to that point, if you are unlucky or did something silly. You should probably also save it, world edit basics later. I will also show you, just by simulation, how you can hit the roof of the enemy, and how airstrikes work, mainly because the airstrike technology can be translated to a multitude of other fields, like sidesteps for example. To build an artillery you usually just put the launch point quite high, use low pressure and high projectile delay, so the TNT has enough time to fly in an arc onto the roof of the enemy, rest for a bit and then explode. This way you let gravity do most of the work. Airstrikes aren't that much more complicated. The main difference is that they have an additional set of projectiles, the injectors, that are used to slam the other projectiles downwards mid-air. A normal artillery can easily be blocked by shields a properly built airstrike can't, because of the maximum range war gears are allowed to extend that you can simply fly around with an airstrike. To easily get two separate projectile chunks, I'll spawn them on the sides and then move them in. Both will be pushed against blocks first, and the blocks will have sideways hitboxes of 1 pixel difference, so here it's 16 pixels and 15 pixels. Remember the explosion entity interaction calculations. Since one chunk is closer to the propellant, it will get more pressure and fly higher than the other chunk. And if you prime it first, you can use it as an injector. In the resulting trace you can see what's called a positive angle. Because the injectors flew less far than the projectiles when they exploded, the projectiles are not just propelled downwards but also forwards. This causes inefficient channels when trying to stab and should be avoided. If injectors and projectiles were roughly at the same position when the injectors explode, the resulting angle would still be positive by the way, 
due to the forward velocity the projectiles had anyways from getting shot over there. So what you have to do to get a neutral angle is use a negative relation, aka have the injectors fly further slash faster than the projectiles. To achieve that you have to change the launch point. Slightly elevate the propellant or let it swim backwards a little bit, so the launch angles are modified. This is easier to do if you work with elevated cannons. If you try building a non-elevated airstrike, you'll notice that getting a neutral angle isn't exactly unproblematic. Automatic cannons are structurally very different to manual ones, and I want to supply you with a few tips for building them. This is the most traditional automatic setup. You might remember seeing this when I introduced automatics. Pistons push the TNT forward onto redstone blocks, so it automatically primes. And then there are gravel stacks that fall down to fill the gaps resulting from the push. This does work fine up to certain clock speeds, but eventually you'll need additional measures. If you have a clock speed lower than 40 RT, TNT is getting primed while there is still propellant in the cannon that has yet to explode. If you were to just let everything fall down, you would end up with the first propellant shooting not only their projectiles, but also kicking around the other TNT inside your own cannon. One way to prevent that is by using lids, for example trapdoors. Since blocks with full hitboxes cancel 100% of the explosion exposure, you can have the next bunch rest on a trapdoor and then simply open it, making the TNT fall down to the launch point. To have the TNT fall through a trapdoor, that trapdoor has to be placed in the lower block half. Trapdoors are theoretically not narrow enough to let TNT fall through, but you can exploit their property of being able to switch their hitbox. If they open while TNT rests on them, the TNT will suddenly be inside the hitbox of the trapdoor and just drop. But eventually you will run into more problems. At higher speeds the gravel doesn't fall fast enough anymore to fill the gaps, so you will need to research pushing methods that don't require gravel and are also able to push faster. Eventually separating the TNT chunks into the single shots becomes a big problem. TNT after TNT primes in rapid succession, and all of them do their prime jump. You have to somehow make sure that they are all fired one by one, with the exactly correct amounts of propellant and projectiles. The field of automatic cannon research is where many high-level teams invest intense amounts of time, and it really pays out. If you enter a competition with a cannon that puts 8 holes through the enemy at points you can designate before every battle, you have a big advantage compared to just any cheap automatic that just slams some TNT against the enemy slowly. Another field I'll count as automation related is quite frequently seen in SAs, QRs and FAs. Auto modes and auto delay. If you operate a cannon that can be continuously loaded, you should probably do that. With manual cannons there is always the 4 second wait time until it is safe to go near the cannon again due to the damage you'd otherwise take. But with semi-autos, quick reloads and full autos, there really is no reason to stop. That is why people started developing cannons that can adjust themselves after every shot. That way, if you keep loading and shooting, you'll eventually have executed all the modes the cannon has to offer, without wasting any time. If the cannon aims at different spots automatically, it has auto mode. If it can automatically adjust the projectile delay, it has auto delay which is especially useful for cannons that don't kill tech on their first shot, for example most cannons built with projectile limits. This is a super basic version of an auto mode setup. By default the cannon shifts, after firing once a block is pushed into the launch point preventing the propellant from swaying over and thus making the cannon fire straight forward. And this is a basic auto delay with shot counter. Every time a shot is fired the dropper drops one of its items. If no items are left, the comparator turns off, which retracts this piston. Now instead of this line, this one transmits the signal, and the repeater is on a higher setting, so there is more delay now. There are also ways to build influenceable automation. You could for example have a big wall of levers that all represent options, most frequently which shot is supposed to hit at which position. Such a wall of options is referred to as an automation matrix. Matrix because there is usually some form of underlying chart style logic that makes operating it easier. Automation can also be counterproductive though. If you have no way to interfere with the automated mode switching, it can happen that you want to hit a specific spot of the enemy right this instant, but simply can't. This is why auto modes are rarely part of any manual cannon. The usage of shields is quite crucial. 
The reason they work is, well, you saw how tightly the prime phases are timed to explode exactly when they are supposed to deal damage, to minimize the amount of TNT needed. By putting a shield on a position you want protected, you make sure that the enemy is forced to use a piercing cannon that needs more TNT, and thus has a more delayed time to strike. Otherwise, their shots would simply slam against the shield and have their velocity cancelled. Shields are quite variable because they are often built specifically for one war gear and or cannon setup. I will tell you the terminology but not provide you with any tutorials myself, since the research and building process is quite straightforward. You have a goal in mind and the rest is flying machine and slimestone experience to make it work. There is a lot more material on this on the internet than on the kinds of specific TNT cannons built in our scene. For the same reason I will also not show any missiles in this video even though they are part of some game modes. The basic idea of missiles is that you have a flying machine with TNT that is primed once it gets stuck. They are featured in many Steam War publics. I won't totally leave you hanging though, I'll link some material in the description. Back to the types of shields and their function. Artillery shields or arty shields are usually one block thick and placed on the roof, with the goal of stopping at least one artillery shot. These were quite effective against new players back in the day, because what you have to do to break them is reduce the projectile delay of your arty, because otherwise the projectiles will slam against the shield, fall down and then explode, and when the next shot arrives there is no hole in the shield to shoot through. If the enemy does leave the delay full even though you have the shield, they will dig down in a different spot though, so be careful to not put anything important below. To prevent that problem and also just to intervene in artillery arches sooner, which makes catching them more likely, you can extend the shield forwards first and then upwards after, creating an extended artillery shield. Wings are basically the same as arty shields just to block the flight path of flanking cannons with bad angles or ones with some specific architectures. These can also be built as extended versions to provide coverage against a wider range of bad flank angles. Pergolas are thin angled shields, not specific to any face, so you usually add that information. They too only have the power to realistically stop a single shot, but they protect a more precise area. While wings and arty shields try to hinder the flight path of a shot, pergolas try to block the resulting damage. Atox are quite similar to pergolas in their purpose, but architecturally different. Only one block of the shield has to be pushed and the remaining surface automatically follows through the power of slimestone. Because only one block of the atox has to be pushed, you can easily do that with a flying machine. So overall you save a lot of space with these. Spikes are extending pillars, one by one, one by two or similar, and also not specific to any face. A single spike usually doesn't help much, unless you have intense luck and an enemy happens to have a mode that shoots exactly on that spike. Spikes are usually spaced at least one block apart vertically, as you can use blocks like endstone walls that extend further than one block with their hitbox. Relocational shields are stored and start moving from a different location than they ultimately end up in. These are frequently used in situations where you want to protect certain positions but don't have the local space to store a shield. Pergolas can be considered a form of relocational shield. Heavy shields are solid blocks of protection. Not a thin layer, but instead a massive wall. This term can come up in a combination too, with spikes for example, as in heavy spike shield, then describing a wall of spikes. Layering is when you stack up multiple shields so they protect each other. Pergolas and atox are frequently layered for example, and in the case of pergolas you would then refer to them as single layer pergola, double layer pergola, etc. World Edit is part of all Wargear servers and that for very good reasons. The simplest one is the schematic system that is used to store all of your technology in files, but it also just makes building more comfortable. One world edit command I use basically every single time when starting any build is slash up followed by any number. This will elevate you by that number of blocks and then put a glass block below your feet. That way you don't have to build pillars to get into the air. Next, the essential part to doing basically anything else with world edit is getting yourself a wooden axe or just typing slash slash wand into the chat. Now you can mark blocks as position 1 with left and position 2 with right click. By doing so you select a three-dimensional box-shaped region that you can now manipulate. I will list some of the commands I use the most when building. All of them are preceded by a double slash. Copy or C to copy the content to the clipboard. Shem save to save the clipboard to a file with a given name. 
paste or P to paste the clipboard, optionally with dash O to paste the content at the original position you copied it from, set to entirely fill the area with any block, either via numeric or worded ID, replace or wrap to replace a given block with a different one, set and wrap except the parameter hand to use whatever block you have currently selected in your toolbar, move to move the contents of the area by a specified amount into the direction you are looking in, Stack to repeat the selected content for the specified amount of times. Move and stack can be extended by dash S to also move the selection to the new area, which can save you many inputs since otherwise only the contents are manipulated, but the selection stays the same. Move, stack and paste can also be extended by dash A to ignore air blocks from the selection or clipboard, so you don't delete blocks just by moving nothing on them. Flip to flip the content on the axis you're looking in. Rotate to rotate the content by a specified number that should be a multiple of 90. And of course, and most importantly, undo or U, and redo or R, followed by the amount of steps you want to un or redo. There are more advanced features with World Edit 2, but knowing about these ones should absolutely be enough to aid your Wargear building. You build some cannons and maybe have some shield experience. Naturally, you want to build a Wargear. Just like for cannons, I want to suggest an order to the build process, and of course there are some tips and tricks involved. First, you should figure out which of your RF slash FAs you want to use. They usually take up the most space and probably have the highest impact. You shouldn't make compromises here. Pick the cannon and then build around it. Now you can pick the rest of your cannons. If you have more cannons that are quite specific with their placement, and maybe larger too, like MLPs for example, place them first. Very high in priority should be stabbing cannons that can cover an as large as possible area each or in combination. The goal is that if one or multiple of your stabbing cannons are missing but you have maybe one to three left, you're still able to cover most of the enemy with stabs. You should also pay close attention to having as few cannons aligned on one axis as possible to prevent the enemy from killing multiple with a single shot. Optionally, people often use a few anti-tech cannons to prevent getting tech KO too quickly. When all cannons are chosen and positioned, it's time to set up shields, and you might have to build them first as you may only have some very specific spaces left, but want a certain type of shield in a certain spot. You will sometimes see holes in shields. Those are barrel extensions that allow you to place shields in front of your cannons and still be able to shoot through. That's another reason why shields often have to at least be adjusted to fit the situation and can rarely be entirely pre-built. The important technology is done now. If the game mode you're building for features rules like having a command bridge or headlights, etc., it's time to construct these now and pay close attention to the specific requirements. And try to avoid creating big armor gaps next to important cannons when placing stuff like command bridges. Everything that has to be wired during the Wargear build process can be wired now. That includes levers or automatic starting mechanisms for shields, automatic cannons, and anything else. You need some way to move between cannons during the fight, as you will be in survival mode and can't fly. Infrastructure is a very subjective topic, but I believe it to be important and will provide my personal opinion. I've been inside of Wargears built by people who don't think it matters, and it really showed. Getting from A to B was a terrible experience. I have built infra on multiple occasions and was never really satisfied. It's really hard and mostly comes down to personal preference. There are two main factors here, the architecture of connections and their layout. For architecture, I suggest something like this. Blue eyes on the bottom provides a speed increase when jumping, which you can constantly do while traversing the connection. Sides consist of walls, so that you have more room around you and don't accidentally stop sprinting. End stone walls provide the same blast resistance end stone blocks do. The ceiling just consists of end stone, but the bottom is an iron trapdoor. That trapdoor lifts you higher, so you jump less high, and can therefore do it more frequently, and it also increases the blast resistance of the lower block space to 6 from 0. Many people also like to color code their floors to aid navigation instead of the trapdoors. The ceiling block could occasionally be replaced with a light source, you can look at their resistances and light levels, but a sea lantern or a glowstone every 8 blocks or so is just fine. Good connection layouts are hard to design. A few general rules and tips. Try to create as few corners as possible, they slow you down and can disorient you. If you can connect something in a straight line, you should probably do it. Don't use scaffolding for vertical movement, if the bottom one breaks, the rest breaks too. 
You can utilize drop shafts like this to have very fast direct routes to lower levels. Make sure your speed is reduced by ladders or vines at the bottom so you don't take fall damage. Placing fence gates like this on junctions allows you to place signs like this. That way you don't have to turn your head to look at a sign. Always knowing by the power of signs where connections lead can lessen confusion. The blue eyes can get annoying when going around corners, therefore I usually leave junctions and cannon entries without the eyes underneath. Parallel junctions can help you to not have to path around in your war gear when there could have been a nicer direct passage. Most importantly, try to keep everything as simple as you can, because the heat of battles increases nervousness and your team might get lost. Everything that doesn't like to take compromises is now in place, so it's time to make the war gear look cool. I won't provide a design tutorial though as it is purely subjective. Look at public war gears of all sorts, look at what your enemies use in battle, get inspired. As some people get really good at this and others have next to no talent or will to practice it, teams often have dedicated designers. By hiding your barrels as well as possible within the design, you can try to prevent enemies from easily aiming at the right spots. And by creating well-faked barrels that don't have any actual cannons attached, you can try to actively draw fire away from your actual cannons. The last step is filling all the remaining spots that can be filled without hindering your tech, like pistons that have to extend, with endstone. Traditionally this is done by hand and with the help of world edit. Be careful not to override any of your important blocks. Currently Steamore already has a built-in feature that lets you select an area and automatically have it filled correctly, unless you left gaps in your cannons or connections. In the future when you are watching this other servers might have this feature too. You have your first self-built warrior and probably want to jump straight into battle. And it's totally fine to just get in there and gain your own experience. There are some purely logical conclusions that I want you to be aware of though that are quite important to win high level fights. Staying calm and keeping chaos to a minimum. The most important point and the hardest one to master. I've seen and been in many fights where people accidentally failed to properly use a cannon in the heat of the moment and ended up missing or blowing up their own cannon, or where there was a lot of panicky yelling within the discord call so important spoken information was hard to communicate. This ends up losing you fights and it's frustrating because it often feels like you could have won. Reloading. If you're currently not actively reloading a cannon, you're probably wasting DPS. Probably quite easy to understand, but I still often see people just wandering around semi-aimlessly or standing in front of their cannon thinking about which mode to use or something like that, and totally wasting a lot of potential damage. You should be aware that the enemy could shoot right where you are any second, so you better get your shots out as quickly as possible before your stuff blows up. Obviously having high CPS and accuracy help a lot here. Scouting is the word for having team members that watch the fight from outside as regular viewers, but that are in a call with you and constantly pass information about where the enemy might have cannons, judged by visible barrels, Beware, those can tactically be faked. Or from which position the enemy is currently shooting to allow counterfire. Or how much your shot was off by. Or which parts of your war gear the enemy has destroyed and so on. Adjusting means that you put all the information provided to you to good use. You don't just need a reliable cannon, you need a person who knows how to use it properly. Which can get quite complicated depending on the amount and type of modes. Also know when to adjust. If your cannon can still probably hit the enemy in a sensible manner, you should definitely be reloading it right now, even if you don't exactly know which mode to use. Though, as long as there is TNT in your war gear, it is dangerous to you, so if you finish reloading the cannon and still didn't figure out what mode to fire in, and are now standing around just thinking, you are risking eating a lot of damage. From the chain reaction a direct hit to your unprimed TNT would cause, so you'd optimally do a bit of multi-processing here. Orientation refers to how well you know the infrastructure in your war gear and how good you are at keeping track of what's down and what's alive. Being good at this means that you spend less time wandering around and more time actively striking the enemy. Having at least the staying calm and reloading part somewhat down will already likely help you out. I want to apologize for my boring way of talking, that probably didn't help your comprehension. I bet your head is insanely overloaded now. There is no shame in not knowing all of this day one of joining the scene. As I said, when we older players joined, none of us knew anything and there was next to no content to watch and learn from, so we just stayed around and built whatever. Slowly learning over time, and you can freely choose that route too, it might even be more fun that way. And again, please practice good sportsmanship at all times, or I'll be sad. 
I, Halem, wish you the best of luck, the most fun, and the best friends in the scene. To conclude this video, I want to express my gratitude towards the following parties for helping me. My team for answering some general questions I had and for being supportive, and also for helping me record some of the parts. The Technical Minecraft and TNT Archive Discord servers for answering many of the questions I had, mainly when working on the TNT property section. JJL21 and Intricate specifically, who are members of said TNT archive server, and were the main helpers and always kind. Yoyo now, a Steamware developer, who helped me with the Warrior Dictionary and also answered a few of my questions. Everyone who works on running and approving the Warrior servers, including staff like developers, supporters, builders, etc., for keeping the scene alive. And Tim7077 and EgalTV and multiple other supporting team members for creating the montage shown in the beginning of the video. And of course, also a huge thanks to the following YouTube channels who let me use their videos as material. Steam War, My Play Planet, Disco Wüste, WarTech, Kaltenstein, Desperados, and Julio Z.